Modern tradition of India is reflected by these Hindus, who remember the Ganges River every sunset as a giver of life and a destroyer of sins, and worship it at Varanasi as part of their daily prayers, as they have done for thousands of years. In the blazing heat of the Indian summer, the yogi Shivnath performs remarkable acts of penance in honor of Krishna. Shivnat has decided to forego the pleasures of mundane life and come into the fold of sadhus. Shivnat's ancestors have done similar penances here. Traditionally, this has always been considered as the place which belonged to one of the heroes of the battle called Kara, as told in the Mahabharat. Ramprasat Birbal, who also lives here, finds many bones washed up from beneath the soil and believes that these belong to the warriors who perished in the battle. This Hindu tradition extends across the whole of Southeast Asia from Thailand, Cambodia and Laos right up to Java, Bali and Indonesia. Celebration of this living tradition of worship to Krishna is found in the most unlikely places. Here, in a dance studio in Leeds, Devika Rao, a dancer, performs in honour of Krishna. S.R. Rao is India's foremost marine archaeologist. When I demolished a modern building, some temple of Vishnu of 9th century came to light below the building. This prompted me to take further deeper excavation and ultimately I came across a 15th century BC settlement. The Mahabharat document describes a beautiful city called Dwarka that was built by Krishna and is said to have been devoured by the sea. Modern-day Dwarka lies off the western coast of Gujarat, and even today, people there celebrate the living tradition of Krishna worship. But what about Krishna's legendary city? Recently, marine archaeologists from the National Institute of Oceanography discovered an entire city under the western coast of Gujarat near Beit Dwarka. Dr. Rao and his team had finally found evidence that proved the existence of Krishna's city of Dwarka that was described as being flooded by ocean waters 36 years after the Mahabharat was written. Many artefacts of considerable antiquity were found from the ocean bed. This seal shows a bull, a unicorn and a goat and provides strong evidence for proof of the story from the Mahabharat, which says that it served as an identity badge for the citizens. Perhaps the most significant evidence supporting Krishna's existence comes from the astronomical references found in the texts of the Mahabharat. There are over 140 of these astronomical references. Dr. Nahari Archer is a professor of physics at the University of Memphis and the world's foremost researcher of the astronomical events described in the Mahabharat text. The Mahabharata war, the date of it, is an important milestone in the chronology of India. Traditionally, Indians have believed that the war took place about 3000 BCE. Modern scholars who have a more critical approach to the study of these epics took a different view. They did not believe the traditional view that the war took place so long ago. And they wanted to determine the day by using a variety of methods, methods based on linguistics, methods based on archaeology, um, the genealogy lists in the Puranas, and methods based on astronomy. And they came up with a plethora of dates ranging from about 5000 BC all the way up to 500 AD. Professor Acha uses a specially developed computer software program that enables him to view the night sky as it would have appeared at any time in the past. 
he has painstakingly reproduced the exact night sky for every reference to it in the Mahabharat. Professor Archer again. Turns out the types of astronomical phenomena referred to in the epic consist of muhurtas, tithis, and then eclipses, comets, and the conjunctions of planets with different stars, and so on. In the Bhishma Parva, Vyasa meets with Dhritarashtra on the eve of the war and uh, recites to him the omens that he has seen. These omens predict the imminent war between the Pandavas and the Kauravas and the terrible events which will befall both the Kuru family and the general population. The most significant of these omens is the appearance of two fiery comets. People generally take the word graha to represent a planet, but Vyasa here specifically represents graha, simply means that any object which can grasp a star, and it can be a planet, a comet, or an asteroid. Here he specifically says that it's a comet because graha tamra aruna shikho prajvalitao ubho. The two grahas with uh, blazing coppery red hair. No planet has blazing coppery red hair, it's only the comets which have that. So Vyasa specifically uh, refers to graha in, in comets as graha. Then uh, I felt that uh, convinced that the verses in Bhishma Parva are really not incoherent, inconsistent, contradictory, but in fact they form a very consistent set. Professor Acha has identified further astronomical references in two of the books of the Mahabharat, namely the Udyoga and the Bhishma Pavas. Again, these were regarded as omens of imminent disaster. These were when Saturn was at Aldebaran and Mars performed a retrograde motion near Antares. Now, the astronomical events which are common to both Udyoga Parva and Bhishma Parva are these. Saturn is at Aldebaran. Mars has performed a retrograde motion at Antares. The lunar eclipse in the month of Kartika, which occurs at uh, Pleiades, is followed by a solar eclipse near Antares. So I searched for the years between 3500 BCE to about 500 CE a range of 4,000 years. In this, there are 137 such conjunctions where um, Saturn is at Aldebaran. Here we see Saturn's transit at Aldebaran. It is an event which is even today considered by Indian astrologers to be associated with great wars and violent events. The last transit of Saturn at Aldebaran was in 2001 AD, the year of ground zero. Saturn's retrogression seemingly predicting the exact month, September. Professor Acha again. And then I searched for those years in which Mars would perform a retrograde motion near Antares. Now Mars does that in about its synodic period, it's about 680 days. So I searched for a period of two and a half years on either side of each of these 137 dates. And it turns out that this reduces the set of dates from 137 to just 17. And then I look for those years where there is a lunar eclipse in uh, the month of Kartika that is near Pleiades. And this reduces the set from 17 to just two. These two years identified by Professor Acha were 2183 BC and 3067 BC. I thought I could use a solar eclipse to eliminate one of those, but it turns out on both of these days, the lunar eclipse is followed by a solar eclipse which occurs in near Antares. In 2183 BCE, the winter solstice occurs in the waning phase of the moon, Krishna Panchami. And in 3067 BCE, it occurs in the waxing phase, and we want the waxing phase. So this is one way to eliminate that this 3067 BCE is the year of the war. Uh, for the 2183 BCE, to satisfy that 64 days between those two intervals, the war must have started on an Amavasya. 
for the new moon day. And we have definite information from the epic that the war did not start or could not have started on an Amavasya because on the 14th day of the war, they break all rules of war. The war continues into night and they break the break only when the moon rises and the wee hours of early in the morning. Now, if the war had started on an Amavasya, the 14th day would have been in the waxing phase and the moon would rise early in the evening and not early in the morning. Moreover, a careful study of the epic yields data about a third eclipse in October 3067 BC, which follows the solar eclipse at an interval of 13 days, just as the epic describes. The evidence presented by Professor Acha overwhelmingly pinpoints 3067 BC as the year when the great battle described in the Mahabharat took place. Detailed examinations of the astronomical references mentioned in the Mahabharat show that they were based on real astronomical events that actually took place and are not a writer's imaginary description. Because the astronomical dates and events described in the Mahabharat have been authenticated by modern scientific method, it is reasonable to conclude that the Mahabharat itself is also a factual description of events that actually took place. In acknowledging this, we are bound to recognize that Krishna, one of the Mahabharat's principal characters, must have been based on a real person. If we also take into account the archaeological evidence and that handed down by the Indian oral and living traditions, we are led to the inevitable conclusion that Krishna did actually exist. Whilst the evidence doesn't prove that he performed miracles or had supernatural powers, does clearly authenticate that there was a real person, a man of quite extraordinary powers called Krishna. The skeptics may be doubtful, but let a believer have the last word. I am like the lotus flower, and Krishna is like the sun. And although there is such a great distance between us, I open simply due to your rays. And without you, how could I even exist?